Okay, I've got 26 viewers and no questions. Okay, so that's what we're now. We, we're having an AP Euro Renaissance hangout. Okay, so I've got a, uh, got a question here that I might defer to Miss No if she shows up. I've um, got a question from Omar. Okay, so... Let's see. And of course, once we get more questions, probably going to give uh, preference to people who are uh, who are following me on Twitter over those who are not. So just keep that in mind um, that if the questions get crowded, those people who are followers are probably going to get their questions um, answered first. Um, let's see. Still trying to get this to work. OK, so so far I've got one question still waiting on. Uh, Still waiting on Miss Noah. Got a uh, you know something about Jacob Burkhart. Jacob Burkhart was a historian of the Renaissance. So keep in mind that Burkhart wasn't an actual uh, Renaissance humanist or anything like that. This guy was just an influential historian who wrote on the Renaissance. And I'm not sure if I've ever actually seen Burkhart show up on an AP European history exam. Uh, so hopefully, Omar, that at least uh, approaches um, answering your question. Okay, so that's the only one we've got right now. All right, thanks for the follow, Muhammad. We've got a new thing. All right, Omar just followed me. Hopefully, uh, he uh, appreciated the answer to his question. Okay, so yeah, keep in mind that Burkhart is the uh, is one of the historians of the Renaissance. And while we're waiting for more questions, let me share my screen real quick so that we can talk about some uh, some resources uh, that are available to you. And I'm going to go ahead and share that. Uh, um, you know, we're going to be taking some Q&A right now. I'm supposed to be joined by Miss Noah, but I haven't uh, been able to get her into the live hangout. Um, keep in mind that I have a Renaissance playlist. Okay, I've got several videos here. Uh, where we've got a video on the Italian Renaissance, Renaissance art, uh, a bit about uh, all uh, just long that I heard that reminded me of Renaissance humanism, uh, a bit on Machiavelli, on a video on the Northern Renaissance, and then one on the Age of Exploration. Um, then this is a massive video that's got uh, AP Euro review. Uh, this is what I did right before the exam last year, and I did some Q&A, and we went over my review guide. Uh, you can go to my website, tomritchie.net, if you go to courses, AP European History, Units of Instruction, Renaissance, and Exploration. And here you can find uh, this uh, in my PowerPoints are here. Uh, you can see the unit packet, and in the unit packet, it's going to show up in just a second. On that unit pack, first of all, it's got some essential content. Now, I've gone through... Uh, lots of old AP European history questions, and I've come up with a list of essential content in my year in my unit guide, uh, which uh, you know I've got this kind of reduced to ten things that students should know. Uh, first of all, you should define humanism as it was understood during the Renaissance. Okay, and let's see if we've got anything new. I don't see anything new on Twitter, so I'm going to talk about that. Uh, you know, talk about that briefly. Um, as far as what is humanism as understood in the Renaissance. Now keep in mind that that's going to be a little bit different than what we might call humanism today. Let's see, we want to uh, get me back on the camera. Um, you know, today when people talk about humanism, they're usually talking about secular humanism and something that is uh, kind of an irreligious mindset. Keep in mind that Renaissance humanism is kind of a fusion of Christian and classical ideals. Uh, we would know this as uh, one of the words used sometimes as syncretism. Um, that while during the Middle Ages people like Aquinas tried to take uh, the classics and reconcile them with Christianity basically on Christian terms, uh, we see that the Renaissance humanists are putting the classics and uh, the Christian tradition kind of on equal footing. 
uh, where one doesn't necessarily serve the other. The two can kind of go together. And humanists are all about, uh, you know, reading Greek and Roman and biblical literature. Okay, so those are the things that we think of as the classics, Greek, Roman, and biblical literature. Um, so the humanists are all about that. Now, of course, uh, Pico della Mirandola, who um, wrote the oration on the dignity of man, uh, this was... Uh, you know, was Pico talking about how, you know, basically kind of articulating what they call the manifesto of the Renaissance. And he's talking about free will and human-centered thinking. And so all of this kind of goes into Renaissance humanism. But keep in mind that Renaissance humanism is not necessarily a philosophy per se. Um, that humanists are, you know, all across the, the spectrum as far as what they think. But what they all have in common is their fascination with the classics when we think of Greek, Roman, and biblical literature. Um, so if you understand that, then you can understand humanism. You can also understand how Renaissance art is influenced by Greco-Roman art. Um, you can understand how, you know, Renaissance architecture is, you know, influenced by classical Greco-Roman architecture. So really the whole key to understanding the Renaissance is this rebirth. Uh, rebirth of what? Well, the rebirth of the classical traditions of ancient Greece and Rome. All right, so uh, let's see if we've got any other uh, any other questions uh, coming up. Um, let's see. Um, let me try. Let me send a, a quick email. We're still trying to get uh, you know Miss Noah onto this uh, hangout to help us out here. And let me go ahead and send something to her real quick. Okay, got that, and let's go ahead and check Twitter and see if we've got any new um, any new notifications, okay? Um, let's see. I don't know if that's like cheating a little bit when we've got, got uh, teachers uh, asking questions. Uh, let's see. So, uh, yeah, Miss Morey's uh, got, a, uh, got a question. What is the North's relationship with God? We've got something coming from uh, Jasmine uh, Dasuki. Um, the North, what are we talking about? Are we talking about Game of Thrones or uh, what? Uh, I'm guessing that, uh, you know, Jasmine, if you could clarify that, my, my guess is that you're talking about the Northern Renaissance, uh, which when you go to my, um, my thing here, let's see. Um, number eight, if you look at my list of things that you need to know for the Renaissance for the exam, uh, compare and contrast the Italian Renaissance and the Northern Renaissance. Okay, so the Italian Renaissance, keep in mind, is very um, individualistic and secular, and it's very focused on free will and the glorification of the individual, the improvement of the individual, that, uh, you know, this is about trying to uh, create this you know, this ideal human that is going to be able to, uh, you know, go around in political circles and that sort of thing. You think about like the Book of the Courtier, which is about being someone who can um, survive in the Court of Princes. And then if you think about Machiavelli's The Prince, this is something, you know, this is a very practical guide uh, to getting by in the world of the Renaissance. Um, so this is Italian Renaissance, you know, designed, you know, really focused on the individual. And that's where, you know, Italian uh, Renaissance humanism kind of uh, focuses on. Now, the Northern Renaissance, this is a... Um, Uh-oh. All right. I got uh, Miss Maury's kind of mad at me. She's throwing me these curveballs. Uh, and um, let's see. We'll see. This, these were the kind of questions that Miss Noah was supposed, to, uh, was supposed to answer. Um, but anyway... We're still kind kind of waiting on her, um, but let's uh, let's see where was I? okay the Northern Renaissance. Uh, this is a Renaissance that is still humanist. Okay, keep in mind now I've got a video on the Northern Renaissance that you might want to watch. But the Northern Renaissance is still humanist. What is the humanist? This is somebody that is dabbling in Greek and Roman and biblical literature. So they're still dabbling in that, but the Northern Renaissance is more Christian than the Italian Renaissance, so it's less secular. Now keep in mind, by secular, we're not talking about irreligious.
religious. These people don't hate religion. Most of them are Christians. Uh, pretty much all of them are Christians. But the Northern Renaissance, when we think about like Erasmus and Thomas More, um, then we think about um, you know the you know this more Christian sort of themed here, and it's themed on like more ideas of social justice. Um, you know, Erasmus is criticizing the church. And he says, look, I mean, the apostles, they live very simply. And then I look over here at the bishops today, and they're supposed to be successors of the apostles. And they're not living so simply. Uh, you know, so, so you see, uh, you know, that we need to change the church, okay? We need to change society. And Erasmus is criticizing the institutional church because he says that this isn't really what the apostles had in mind. This isn't how the apostles lived. Um, and then if you look at Thomas More's Utopia, this is very Northern Renaissance, that you really see um, the influence of Plato, uh, which Plato was a very influential philosopher uh, you know, for these Renaissance humanists because he's focusing on the human ideal. And uh, you know, if you look back at Plato's Republic and he's contemplating the ideal state uh, and that sort of thing. Well, Thomas More in Utopia you know, gets on this theme of the ideal ideal state. And the ideal state is uh, built on kind of uh, a socialist construct that if our society was more, you know, more oriented towards sharing and communal living and communal goals and less materialistic, then there would be enough to go around. There's this song by Tool that I use in my class called Ride In Two. Uh, and it really kind of articulates some of these themes of utopia um, where, you know, there's, uh, you know, this idea that there would be enough to go around if only we allocated resources differently. And so Thomas More's utopia is much less individualistic than what you're going to see coming out of the Italian Renaissance. So if you want a little more than that, you can watch my lecture on the Northern Renaissance and, uh, you know, and get that, get that content. Um, let's see, it looks like we've got a few more, uh, more people here. And uh, let's see. What the heck do we need to know, T. Rich? Okay, that's uh, that's one of my students, and we're uh, we're getting there. Okay, now um, Arely Hernandez. Let's see, Arely Hernandez, who is following. Awesome. Let me go ahead and answer this question. The characteristics that allowed the Renaissance in Italy to begin. Okay, so first of all, you've got to think about the classics. All right, now Petrarch, who is known as the father of humanism, and that's another thing that I've got on this guide here. If you want to look on my, you know, you can access this guide through my website, tomritchie.net, and let me share the screen with you real quick. Um, that I've got a list of people that you would benefit from knowing uh, in this unit guide. So one of these is Petrarch. Okay, Petrarch, the so-called father of humanism. Well, during the Middle Ages, monks, you know, kept track of, say, of you know, old Greco-Roman texts, copying them by hand. But Petrarch found some that were, you know, in really a dilapidated, state. Okay, so here's one thing that Petrarch is rediscovering the classics. Uh, and this is very important that the interest in the classics is being revived. Um, and then you have in 1453 the, the fall of Constantinople. All right, in 1453, the fall of Constantinople, the Turks go into Constantinople and they close the Christian University. Well, what happens here is the Greek scholars, um, they don't have a job now, but then there are all these Italians who are all of a sudden interested in understanding Plato. In the Middle Ages, they'd read Aristotle in Latin translation, um, but you start to see the first Latin translations of Plato. So the fall of Constantinople is feeding this. Also, you've got to think about, uh, you know, you've got to think about the Oh, sorry. I've got. I'm getting distracted by some of these tweets coming. I've probably turned my turn my phone down here. All right. That these works of art in the Renaissance, they don't just make themselves. All right. Uh, an artist needs a patron. So another thing that's happening is commerce, and that's where the Medici really come in. The Medici, who were, um, you know, a, an Italian family in Florence, Florence, big city in the Renaissance, where Michelangelo came from, and the Medici got into banking. And this is something that during the Middle Ages, uh, usury, U.S. S-U-R-Y, usury, this is the, pro the practice of lending money with interest. And this was banned during the Middle Ages by the Pope. 
uh, the Pope, uh, keep in mind that Jesus, uh, when he was uh, when he was alive, um, he talked about how when you loan money to somebody, you shouldn't even think about getting paid back. That just you know that shouldn't be a concern um, of yours. Uh, and well, if you apply those principles to business, it doesn't really work. But keep in mind that the Pope was a pretty dominant uh, guy. The Church was a dominant institution, and so Christians were very much discouraged from being in the money lending business. And that's why Jews did most of this during the Middle Ages. Well, what happens is things are secularizing and Christians are starting to get involved in money lending. Uh, things are getting more secular. The Pope doesn't have as much autocratic authority here. Um, so that's another thing that, uh, you know, the conditions are created for that. And that people are involved in commerce. So wealth is being generated. And that is a precondition for the Renaissance. Also, you've got several inventions like the printing press. Um, so when I think about the, uh, you know, the vehicles of the Renaissance, you know, I'm thinking about, uh, in you know, invention. I'm thinking about, uh, you know, this patronage. All right, people like the Pope and the Medici, they were patrons of the arts and patrons of artists. Um, in this way, you could see all these works of art that, uh, you know, would have never been uh, produced, that they are being produced. Uh, you know, so really the rediscovery of the classics, uh, inventions, um, that people are starting to get more involved in commerce, and so wealth is being generated that allows uh, people like the Medici to patronize artists. You've got the fall of Constantinople. Um, so there is a lot uh, going on here that is leading to the Renaissance. Okay, and uh, let's uh, let's see what's going on here. All right, uh, let's see. All right, so all right, yes, Muhammad has noticed there are a lot of people that are commenting questions on YouTube. Now, the thing is about the YouTube thing, a lot of you are talking back and forth on that, so it's hard for me to understand to find the questions. Um, so Twitter is a much better tool for asking questions uh, because I get to scroll through and actually uh, see everything. Uh, now Eliana on Twitter has forwarded a, who's one of my students, has forwarded a question. Um, okay, so because, you know, she found it to be good. So if you find a question in the conversation, which the conversation on the YouTube video is more for y'all to talk to each other, and that's great if y'all want to talk to each other, answer each other's questions and dialogue. Awesome, but I'm looking at the Twitter feed to, you know, to see the questions here. All right, so, uh, you know, Ashley Marie is watching, according to Eliana, and wants to know why the Renaissance started in Italy, what the impact on the North was. Okay, I think I've, I've already talked about that, and of course, uh, the impact on the North, the people in the North are also interested in, uh, the, in the classics. All right, so uh, let's see. Cody asked, how did the role of women in general change during the Renaissance? Excuse me, simple answer is that it didn't, all right? The Renaissance uh, was, was, a, was a pretty sexist movement, uh, you know, as, uh, you know, you see like women's rights really aren't going to take root until really the French Revolution. Uh, you know, humanism was really about the guys. Uh, you know, if you look at Renaissance poetry, uh, Petrarch, uh, you know, the father of humanism, Petrarch wrote um, a series of, you know, poems called the Canzoneri to his love, Laura. And Petrarch was writing the Canzoneri, he was writing this in in Italian, in the vernacular. Why? Because he's writing love poetry, and that's for the ladies. The ladies understand the vernacular. They understand the everyday language. Now, when Petrarch was writing his epic poem, Africa, about Scipio Africa, Canis, uh, going down into Italy and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, Scipio Africanus, uh, you know, that's, you know, this is a war poem. This is an epic poem. This is a poem for the guys. And so Petrarch writes this in Latin because an educated man was supposed to be able to read Latin, whereas an educated woman was uh, only uh, you know, supposed to understand the vernacular. If you look at the book of the courtier, um, in this book, um, Castiglione says that. Uh, you know, I mean, there there are different expectations for women and men, okay? So he's talking about, you know, how a man should behave versus how a woman should behave. 
Uh, now, of course, there were some rich women who were patronizing the arts and that sort of thing, but it's important to understand the inherent sexism of humanism, that uh, humanism was really, uh, you know, kind of a boys' club uh, more than anything else. And this is influenced by, you know, pervading, uh, you know, views of women that, women are just fundamentally unsuited for the public sphere because, uh, you know, they've got, uh, you know, just different uh, what have you. Uh, that, you know, keep in mind Eve ate the fruit first. Uh, you know, women can be a corrupting influence. Uh, this is something, I mean, don't kill the messenger here, okay? Uh, this is something that, you know, it's just very convenient if men want to preserve their political power. It's very it's very convenient to say like, oh, well, women just, uh, they're just not made for this sort of thing. And even when you get to the Enlightenment, a lot of these uh, things are still happening. You know, even Rousseau who says, don't make a man out of your daughter, make a woman out of her. Um, so keep that in mind that you really don't have the birth of modern feminism until, uh, you know, during and after the French Revolution. All right, so uh, let's see. Uh, taking Renaissance test tomorrow was wondering, what are the characteristics of the high Renaissance? Thanks for your question, James. Um, and the High Renaissance is really just kind of like, it's kind of like the middle um, of it. Uh, same thing with the Middle Ages. You know, it's like, you know, nobody's, uh, you know, smoking drugs or anything like that. That not so, that sort of High Renaissance. Uh, but this is the Renaissance really at its peak, okay? So what I think of is about 1500 when I think of the High Renaissance, that we're talking about, you know, 30 to 50 years on either side of 1500. So think of that as the peak. So it's like 1500, things are kind of building up to it, and then they are kind of winding down and going into other movements that will follow later. Um, and so the Renaissance is peaking here. That's the high Renaissance when the Renaissance masters are putting out their best work and all of that. And you start to see after that it starts to wane, and you start to see other art movements uh, show up and that sort of thing. So, you know, the high Renaissance just describes the Renaissance at its peak, the middle of it, kind of like the high Middle Ages describes the Middle Ages in the middle of it, really kind of at its peak. Uh, the late Middle Ages, where that's that world's kind of falling apart and leading into the world of the Renaissance and kind of the birth of the modern world. All right. Why were there such drastic uh, characteristics in Renaissance art um, compared to the Middle Ages? Okay. Renaissancean. Renaissancean is not a word, David, but I think that's still uh, very interesting. Uh, so thank you for uh, for sharing that and giving me new words to think about. Um, the Renaissance art, departing from medieval art, is very intentional. Keep in mind that I've got a video on Renaissance art that you might want to look at. It's just it's it's a slide cast, nothing extremely fancy, but I'll show you the different works of art. Uh, my students might want to keep in mind that there are some slides that I kind of skipped over because I just messed up something in class. So you might want to make sure that you look at that part of the lecture that I skipped over before class, if any of my actual students are watching. All right, but uh, the departure for medieval art was very um, intentional. Medieval art is very flat. Um, it's really made so that you can understand the point of it. Uh, if you look at it, it's mostly like religious. Um, you know, it's, it's not really designed to look like real life. Uh, this is something that um, you know, so the thing is, and it's not really modeled on Greco-Roman art. Keep keep in mind that uh, Greeks uh, and later the Romans, after they're Hellenized, they like to make statues of naked people and stuff like that. And that's not really something that uh, Christians are, um, you know, really all that into, uh, you know, just uh, statues of naked people and all that. It's like when Donatello sculpted his David, this was the first freestanding bronze statue, or just freestanding nude statue, uh, really in about a thousand years, uh, because, you know, the church wasn't like, hey, sculpt me a freestanding naked guy. That, yeah, okay, that just, that stuff, yeah, that's not really like a big, like, Christian thing when you think about it. So, you know, that's, it, it's very much an intentional departure based on the classics, all right? And, uh, you know, that's so, and the characteristics of Renaissance art, keep in mind you're talking about vivid, bright colors, you're talking about perspective, um, this sort of 3D uh, look that it's lifelike. 
um, that you have balance, uh, you know, between uh, you know all the sides and all of that kind of stuff, and then you have, in a lot of cases, classical themes. All right. Um, so let's see. Artists and writers during the Middle Ages, Eliana sending this from Humble Gamer, and uh, that's really, the Middle Ages are kind of outside the scope of this uh, course a bit, okay? Um, okay, so Omar is wanting me to talk about Renaissance monarchies. Um, yeah, the, uh, you know, so, so you could see here the, um, let's see, Renaissance monarchies in terms of power structures. Now what we would know as the quote unquote new monarchs, uh, which this is something else that you would need to know for uh, for the exam. Uh, keep in mind if you've got the guide on my on my website, uh, that's number nine. Explain the rise of the new monarchs in England and Spain, the late 15th, early 16th centuries. Identify their key achievements. I don't have a video on the new monarchs, but I need to get to that. Keep in mind that the new monarchies, uh, you know, you've got Henry the Seventh in England, followed by Henry the Eighth and Elizabeth, you know, basically the Tudors um, in England, and then you've got Ferdinand and Isabella in Spain. Then you've got some people in France that I don't even know their names, but if you you're into that sort of thing, um, you know, look up uh, the new monarchs in France. Uh, but basically, what all of the new monarchs have in common is that they are, uh, you know, all of these new monarchs are increasing the power of the monarchy. When you look back at the Middle Ages, you see that, uh, you know, people are, uh, you know, the kings are really just part of the power structure. Um, that you've got the popes, you've got the nobles, you've got the towns, that the kings are really weak in comparison to what you might think of as a king. So what you start to see is that Ferdinand and Isabella consolidate things. Uh, one of the first things they do in 1492 when they take over is that they proclaim the Catholic religion to be the only legal religion in France, I mean in Spain. So you see religious uniformity here. Whereas when the Muslims were governing Spain, uh, you know, you had a religious pluralism because you had a religious minority governing a religious majority. So it was like, if you want to be a Jew or a Christian, that's great. Just pay us a tax uh, as long as you're a person of the book and not a pagan or something like that. But when Ferdinand and Isabella complete the Reconquista, um, they decide everybody's going to be a Christian. And so that, uh, you know, they inaugurate curate the Spanish Inquisition, which according to Monty Python, nobody expected. I've still got to play that for my own students. If you put in Monty Python, Spanish Inquisition, great thing. Of course, watch the rest of this uh, hangout first. So, you know, they are consolidating the power of the monarchy under um, their rule and standardizing religion. They are also gathering wealth uh, through colonies and that sort of thing. Um, Henry VII of England, after the War of the Roses, uh, Henry VII, uh, you know, sets himself up and he increases taxes. Um, that was one thing that uh, people resented about him was the tax burden. He also had a very law and order mentality. Uh, somebody stole a loaf of bread, string them up sort of thing. Um, and then he's setting up this court of the star chamber so that he can try nobles uh, in his own secret courts. And so really what you're seeing is that the power of the monarchs is increasing, whereas the power of the nobility and the church is decreasing. And you're going to see the new monarchies, this is kind of a lead in to the age of absolutism later where you'll see monarchs like Louis XIV fully consolidate uh, you know, their countries under their rule. Um, but the new monarchies, I tend to focus on France. I mean, uh, focus on England and Spain. Uh, these new monarchs are setting the stage for the absolutism that's going to come along later. All right, and let's see if we've got we've got some other questions here. Um, let's see. Um, Lorenzo de' Medici was uh, kicked out of Florence. Why was that? Now you're getting into like a lot of internal politics, which I was hoping to have Miss Noah here because she's kind of an expert on the Renaissance. Um, looks like you tweeted that to uh, to her, um, and let's see if she's answered that yet, Abby. Um, don't see an answer for that, but basically keep in mind that uh, Florence was a republic. It was kind of a uh, you know love uh, or I mean Florence a republic that you had a lot of you know, upheavals and that sort of thing, uh, you know, here that sometimes the Medici would be on top, sometimes their enemies would be on top, and you have all of this, you know, political wrangling, which is why you've got Machiavelli who's writing a book like The Prince, and Machiavelli's thinking about 
what kind of ruler would we need that can stay in power, that can get past all of these political wranglings that are going on in Florence? So, Abby, the main thing is to realize that, okay, I mean, you're never going to be asked on the exam why Lorenzo de' Medici was kicked out of Florence, but it is useful to understand that Lorenzo de' Medici was the head of his family, uh, which was one of many factions that existed in Florence that had a tumultuous uh, government. Um, Let's see, why was the Renaissance a turning point in Western civilization? Uh, Cody, I think I've probably answered that uh, so on and so forth, uh, you know, a, a bit. Uh, but, you know, think about the Renaissance as this rebirth of the classics that really kind of a repudiation of this medieval mindset where the you know, this, this medieval mindset where the church is really supreme, where you're looking at this life as preparation for the next life. You've got this world where it's, it's dominated by the nobility and the church. And so really in looking back, at classics, the Renaissance, the backward looking movement, it's really setting us up to be able to look forward. Okay, so really just by go by digging deeper and connecting with this, uh, you know, with this Greco Roman um, sort of uh, tradition, that's something that, you know, turns us more on, uh, you know, you think about it, that the Renaissance is the secularism that we have uh, today now, uh, you know, which has its basis in the Renaissance. Now, one of my own students has dialed in uh, to ask a question live. Um, this is Akash, and Akash, let's go ahead and hear your question. We're going to put you up on the big screen and see what you have to ask me. All right, okay. Um, so my question is, um, who was Thomas Aquinas? Aquinas? Whatever. Okay, whatever. Who was Thomas Aquinas? Thomas Aquinas is from the Middle Ages, uh, Akash, and he was in your summer reading. Yes, I just want to know in depth about him. In depth about okay. him. He's not going to be on the exam. He lived before oh. 1450, Akash. True, true. Okay, okay. Yeah, we probably should have rehearsed your question before you came in on this. Huh? No, I know. I just joined and then I didn't know you were actually going to ask me a question. Oh, okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Go ahead and mute yourself um, for a bit, and if you come up with another question, just kind of wave at me frantically so I'll see you there, and uh, let's see what you've got. Or are you looking on the YouTube thing right now where people have questions yeah. and that sort of thing? Yeah, uh, I paused it. How about next time I'm going to pull you up, and if you see something good, go ahead and ask that for me, okay? All right. All right. All right. Fine. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So... Let's see. He muted himself. I don't even see him anymore. We don't. I don't know. We'll see if he comes back. Uh, that uh, that was a kosh. Uh, good uh, good friend of ours here. Um, all right. So uh, the importance of humanism on the Southern Renaissance. Okay, uh, Dakota. I've already gotten uh, kind of gotten that. Now keep in mind that we wouldn't call it the Southern Renaissance. We would call it. Uh, the Italian Renaissance. So you think about the Northern Renaissance, like in England, the Low Countries, Germany, that sort of thing, and then the Italian Renaissance. Okay, so those are the two uh, the two Renaissances we're thinking of for the exam. Uh, now I've got a few uh, tweets from uh, Miss Noah, so you might want to uh, follow Miss Noah. She is at Miss Noah R H S M S Noah R H S. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. Um, she was supposed to be here tonight with us, but we had a few technical difficulties. Um, still kind of getting uh, getting the hang of all this technology. Um, so you know, you may want to think about following Miss Noah, who's an AP Euro teacher who has a much more advanced uh, background in the Renaissance specifically than I do. She's got like a master's degree in this stuff. So think about following her and asking her, you know, some of these more complex questions that you have, because I was going to kind of hand off some of these things to her, uh, was the original plan. So just, uh, you know, go ahead and dialogue with her. She is answering some questions. So even though she couldn't be with us here in the Hangout, um, she is on Twitter. So go ahead and uh, hit her up on Twitter. And I don't know, Miss Noah, if you were in the, uh, in the chat room uh, that comes along with this Hangout, that perhaps you can uh, help moderate that if you're not doing that already. Um, so let me go ahead and check on some more uh, some more questions. Um, let's see. Okay, uh, let's see. 
Eliana, you must have come in late, um, you know, if you're asking for a broad definition of humanism. I think I already kind of did that. Um, the Italian city-state's political structures. Okay, now, Arelli, that's going to be, um, you know, pretty much different everywhere you go. Uh, Florence was in name a republic. Now, keep in mind that uh, communist China is in name a republic, uh, but we in America wouldn't think of that as a republic. So really, uh, you know, a republic is kind of seen as, you know, anywhere that doesn't have a king by some standards. And so you've got all these factions vying for power and that sort of thing. I would recommend maybe uh, tweeting that at Miss Noah um, and seeing what, uh, seeing what you see there. Um, all right, so let's see. Um, high Renaissance, peak of art movements and patronage. Okay, so keep in mind, Miss Noah says to remember that uh, you know it's also the patronage that's uh, that's happening here. Um, yes, David, you are right. Renaissance and can be a word if I want it to be. Um, let's see. And so uh, let's see. Cody, how did Machiavelli's The Prince reflect the political realities of the time? Um, so, Cody, um, I'm going to go ahead and recommend that you watch my video on Machiavelli, um, that that's something that, uh, you know, I kind of go on with Machiavelli and I give you a very detailed sort of analysis. Um, keep in mind, as far as the political realities, Machiavelli is looking at Italy, which is fragmented into all of these, uh, you know, independent city-states, and he's thinking, I mean, think about these guys are into the classics, and so you look at the classics, and it's like, whoa, Rome governed this huge empire, and now Italy can't even be united. Well, let's look back at those Romans, and how is it that they were able to do something that we're not able to hold a candle to now. Um, so Machiavelli, when he's looking at those political realities, he's thinking about the type of ruler that could not only uh, unite Florence, but could unite Italy um, as well. So he's looking really, he's kind of foreshadowing the whole unification of Italy, uh, if you think about it that way. Um, so that's really as far as just a short version of how Machiavelli reflected the political realities at the time. Ellie, broad definition of humanism, that is the interest in the classics, Greek, Roman, biblical literature. Uh, and of course, humanism is also, if you look at it by those who call humanism a philosophy, that uh, this is based on individualism and free will and thinking about things on this earth rather than primarily uh, the state of your soul in heaven. Okay, so so just keep that, keep that in mind. All right, uh, now, another thing here, uh, Ms. Noah is answering uh, one of Cody's questions, uh, that the printing press is also creating more literacy, okay? So this is really another thing that's going on with the printing press being integral to the Renaissance. Uh, Machiavelli, um, compared to the principles of the late Middle Ages, let's see, Jasmine, that's... Uh, probably just a little bit outside the scope of the course. Keep in mind that the Middle Ages established context, but you're not going to get questions on the Middle Ages on the AP European History exam. Um, so I have my students read about the Middle Ages for summer reading because you have to understand the Middle Ages to get an AP Euro, but the AP Euro course starts in 1450, which is pretty much the end of the Middle Ages. So just keep that in mind that while you may have done some things with the Middle Ages in your class, uh, that they're not going to figure really much into the AP European history exam. Um, how did Dante's The Divine Comedy impact society? Ashley, uh, once again, that's kind of outside the scope of the course. Now, of course, Dante uh, was writing in the vernacular Italian, and this is something that catches on, and you start to see like the Italian, like, like a standardized Italian language form, but uh, this really kind of gets out of my purview going into but you're not going to get questions on the Middle Ages. On the okay, yeah, Kosh, if you, um, let's see, you've unmuted oh, yeah. yourself. Okay, right, yeah, you I am for me? Uh, yeah, I actually do. Um, you know those two friends, like during the Northern Renaissance, what were their names? Like best buddies? Yeah, those best buddies, okay. You mean uh, Sir St. Thomas More and Erasmus. Yes, yes, those. Correct. Um, yes, those what guys. were they like? Um, friends, like uh, they had like a similar topic they were talking about. What was that? 
Yes, they were, of course, both fascinated with, uh, you know, with works of uh, literature. Specifically, there was one poem that, one poet that they really liked, uh, Lucian, um, who was a, uh, you know, Roman era Greek satirist, and they both got a kick out of his writing. Uh, you know, so they were reading a lot of the same stuff. Now, of course, they were both interested in that sort of social reform, um, and then they were just best friends. They'd go vacation, you know, spend time at each other's houses and that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, the friendship of Moore and Erasmus, uh, you know, is something that's very, um, you know, critical for understanding the Northern Renaissance. Okay. Okay, that's all I needed to know. All right, right now, thank you. Go ahead and mute yourself, and we might see you again yeah. before this thing. And remember, over. subscribe. Oh, subscribe. <laughs> yes, yes, Akash, definitely. If you haven't subscribed to my channel already, go oh, ahead gee. and do that. That's a great idea. Okay, Akash, go ahead and mute. Okay, excellent. So we might see him again uh, in a bit. All right, so uh, let's see. Um, the Divine Comedy. Okay, so James. All right, to what extent was humanism a strength and a threat to the Catholic Church? Okay, so if we look at uh, the Catholic Church, now, of course, humanism is in some ways uh, a threat uh, to the Catholic Church because really, when you're delving into the classics, you have a chance that somebody might discover something that's really kind of against Catholic doctrine. Uh, keep in mind that throughout most of European history, and you know, Pope Francis, the current Pope, is trying to change this a bit or this perception as the Catholic Church is a very regressive, conservative force um, in Europe, and the Catholic Church would just assume people uh, believe everything the Church teaches. Now, Humanism and this kind of syncretism that's going on. Uh, one of my favorite uh, humanists is uh, Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, who wrote the Oration on the Dignity of Man. And this was the introduction to his 900 theses. Like Martin Luther wrote 95 theses, Pico, Pico be like, that's nothing. Like I wrote 900 theses. And his 900 theses are about various topics. They're like about religion, philosophy, even magic. Um, and he's, he's consulting all of these things. When you read the Oration on the Dignity of Man, he's quoting the Greeks. He's quoting a Muslim scholar. Because keep in mind, the Muslims have had their golden age during the Middle Ages while Europe uh, was comparatively regressive. So, you know, he's using the Muslims, he's using the Greeks, and uh, he's using also uh, the Christian tradition, and he's kind of putting all those things together. So it's really, you see that the Catholic Church is no longer in a position to kind of call all of the shots, and so... Um, Pico's 900 Theses were actually, uh, you know, opposed by the Catholic Church. Uh, they didn't agree with this idea of syncretism. They wanted Christianity to be up here, and if you're going to study the classics, do it in a fashion like Aquinas or anybody in the Middle Ages where you're trying to reconcile, um, you know, these classics with Christianity. Um, there was a Christian saint, uh, Saint Basil the Great, in the fourth century, who wrote, uh, you know, an address to young men on the so-called right use of Greek literature, uh, with the connotation that there's a wrong use. Uh, so, in a lot of ways, humanism kind of, uh, you know, challenges. Uh, this view of the church. Now, the other thing, though, is if you look at the Reformation, and this is going to be something where humanism really goes along with Catholic doctrine, that the Catholic Church is really into the idea of free will, um, and that the human being, um, you know, has a say in their salvation, whereas you look at reformers like Martin Luther and John Calvin, and they'll challenge the idea of free will, especially Calvin. Uh, you know, Calvin is very hostile to the idea of free will, doesn't really believe that we have it at all, um, that really any good work that we do is a product of the grace of God. So in that sense, the Catholic Church during the Reformation is going to kind of toe the humanist line in the sense that uh, it is uh, advocating free will, uh, you know, as an instrument for salvation. All right, and uh, then Miss Noah, a while back, uh, you know, answered questions about the new monarchs, uh, you know, in France and in the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, Louis the Eleventh and Francis the First in France, and Maximilian the First and Charles the Fifth in the Holy Roman Empire are new uh, new monarchs. Uh, goes along with the question we had earlier. 
Okay, we have already been over the the causes of the Renaissance. So for those of you that have joined us kind of midstream, uh, make sure that once we're finished, go back and watch what we've already watched because there are some of you that I'll tell you, well, I've already answered that question. I think Miss Noah said the same thing to a few people on Twitter. So if you're told that that question's already been answered, then once we're done, just go ahead and look, and you'll be able to see what uh, you know what questions have already been answered. Um, Let's see um, what effect Machiavelli's The Prince had on politics. Uh, we've been over The Prince enough. Uh, I'm going to refer anybody with further questions on The Prince. Watch the video that I've already made there. Um, and another thing, just I will tell you quickly, Machiavellian, this is where the end justifies the means. But all of that's in the video, so make sure to go ahead and watch that video because I explain that a lot more in depth. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got a lot of things here with, uh, you know, with the Q, you know, with Q and A that we're going to still need to get to. Um, and really I'm going to try to wrap this up by about eight. So let's see what we've got, uh, what we've got here. All right. Let's see. Uh, okay. So let's see. We've got, uh, we've got that. Let's see. Ashley, asking your question in all caps does not necessarily uh, make it any more relevant to the uh, to the exam, but thank you. Um, all right, reading through history has uh, some questions about geography and that sort of thing. Teachers keep throwing me curveballs. Like y'all, y'all need to stop that. Y'all, y'all are cracking me up. All right, let's see. Um, Politico. I think some of them are asking me questions like to to get me uh, get me all confused on here. All right, so let's see. Machiavelli's. I've got another question on Machiavelli. Okay, so um, all right, so Miss Noah, it looks like she's talking about the Medici in Florence uh, that Lorenzo de Medici was temporarily excommunicated. Um, by the papacy because of a big conspiracy called the Pazzi, or I'm guessing Pazzi, like pizza or something, P-A-Z-Z-I, conspiracy. So if you asked about that, P-A-Z-Z-I, okay, so uh, very good. Um, the uh, habsburg Valois Wars uh, going on uh, at that uh, at that time. So you've got the Holy Roman Empire. Let's see, I wish Miss Noah were here uh, to talk about some more of these things. Um, let's see. All right, we've got, uh, yeah, she's still, let's see, um, things are taking longer than expected. Okay, so um, asking about Raphael's contributions. Raphael was uh, quite a, uh, thank you, Miss Maury. Uh, you know, Raphael was quite uh, a character, Sarah. Now, in my lecture uh, that's on YouTube on Renaissance art, uh, you know, I talk about Raphael in particular, and one thing that's really uh, interesting. Now, um, I would recommend uh, that uh, there, there's an epic rap battles of history that a student shared with me that uh, you know is really funny, and it's got basically the Renaissance masters versus the Ninja Turtles. Uh, if you have time to watch that after the hangout, great stuff, uh, and it's actually somewhat historically accurate and not quite as crude as some of their work is. Um, but Raphael, one thing that that I like about Raphael is while you know you see a lot of like male subjects uh, Raphael painted a lot of women um, and not like male models uh, you know that are painted as women like there's one painting where you see like you know Hera Zeus's wife and she like shows up and she's got like these like you know huge triceps that would like make any man jealous and that's because it's not a woman it's some bricklayer that they told hey why don't you uh, you know come on and uh, let us uh, use you as a model for a woman uh, Raphael actually paints uh, some very, very beautiful women. Uh, there was one one point where Raphael, uh, you know, couldn't concentrate uh, because he was so in love with this woman, and his patron, uh, you know, basically arranged for this woman to live with him while he was painting. Um, and of course, the you know the theories of the time about Raphael's death went right back to Raphael's, uh, you know, very uh, passionate uh, love of women. Uh, so anyway, that's, uh, let's see, we've got uh, some, uh, but yeah, Raphael, and also keep in mind that the School of Athens, which I talk about in my um, Renaissance art video, that this is really, in my opinion, like the best uh, piece of Renaissance art, and since we've got that question, and uh, since I dodged uh, Miss Maury's question um, from earlier, and am eager to uh, avoid her wrath, let's go ahead and take a quick look at the School of Athens. 
and I you know look at this in a little more detail um, in uh, my video. But uh, what you see here in Raphael's painting um, is first of all you see all you see the balance. Okay, this balance that for everything here it's here. Every there's something here. There's something here. Classical art is very balanced. You see bright colors. Okay, all of the colors are very bright. You see perspective. You see this is a hallway. It's in 3D. You know this big uh, forum and everything is in 3D. When you look at this, it's almost like you can't really imagine this being painted on a flat surface. And what really distinguishes this. More than anything is uh, the presence of classical themes. Okay, where you see here that is Zoroaster, uh, the founder of the uh, Persian religion of Zoroastrianism. This guy sitting on the steps is Diogenes, who was a cynic philosopher who didn't like people. He'd go around with a lantern looking for an honest man in broad daylight. Never found one. Um, then there is Socrates over there corrupting some youth, even an old guy being corrupted as well. But Socrates is there having a conversation, much like you can imagine him being. Now, this is a woman, um, Hypatia, who was a female mathematician um, in Christian era Egypt around the 4th century. And this woman was torn apart by a mob of Christians. Um, so in a way, she's kind of a pagan martyr. Um, and what's interesting about this particular painting is while a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of Renaissance art uh, goes into biblical themes and that sort of thing, I don't think there's a single Christian in this painting. Um, and then, of course, at the very center, you've got Plato and Aristotle. Plato's pointing up at the sky, pointing to his idealism, whereas Aristotle's like, whoa, 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 teacher. Let's think about where we are right now because this world is real. Um, and Plato and Aristotle being right in the middle, you know, the school of Athens where you have these Athenian philosophers. And what really sets this painting apart is not just its technical perfection. Um, but also that you've got this emphasis on classical themes, okay? So, I mean, you've got this very, you know, classical sort of, you know, mentality here and really brings all of that uh, to life. Uh, so that is uh, something that is very important about Raphael's uh, The School of Athens. All right, so uh, let's see. Omar, uh, the motives behind the age of exploration, the three G's, God, glory, and gold. Okay, God, glory, and gold. These are the three G's of, um, of the age of exploration. Keep in mind that they want to spread Christianity. Um, then they want to, these conquistadors that go to the new world, they want to get glory for themselves. They want to build an empire. Keep in mind, Spain had just finished the Reconquista, and really sending Columbus out is kind of like, hey, We've consolidated our country. Now let's build an empire. And Columbus is going out there for glory, but also for gold. Uh, whether it's uh, you know Columbus uh, and others uh, going to the Americas, Cortez, people like that, um, or the Portuguese like Vasco da Gama going to India. Um, these people are looking for riches. They want to reach the so-called Indies. Uh, so they want gold, spices. They want money. So they want to spread Christianity, God. Um, they want to uh, build an empire and a name for themselves, glory. And then they want to make money, gold. God, glory, and gold. And of course, I've got a video lecture on the age of exploration that I would encourage you to watch because this is something that gets featured on the exam quite a bit. Um, and let's see what we've got. Uh, what we've got next? Wow. Let's see. Um, all right, that is a tall order, Ashley. Um, I've already talked about women participating in the Renaissance. Uh, it's pretty, pretty minimal. All right. So besides uh, being uh, patrons of the arts here and there, uh, not so much. Uh, but I've already addressed that in more detail earlier in the hangout. Uh, so just keep in mind that really we've got a uh, we've got a boys club here. Um, let's see. So, uh, you know, I've already talked about Petrarch. I've talked about Pico della Mirandola. Um, I don't see like, let's see, who is this? Daisy in address, Daisy in address. Um, Lorenzo Valla. Okay. I haven't talked about Lorenzo Valla. Lorenzo Valla wrote uh, a treatise on the false donation of Constantine. Now, here's where you get into the humanist emphasis on the original languages. All right, so what happens is the Pope has this donation of Constantine. 
And what this is, is it's a letter from Constantine to the Pope saying that basically I'm going to go ahead and give you, uh, you know, the, the Italian peninsula. Uh, that uh, that you've got, or at least like the papal states around Rome, and Constantine, the first Christian emperor, is telling the Roman Pope that I want you to have this, that this is my land, this is part of the Roman Empire, and I'm giving it to, it to you. So if people are asking the Pope, why is it that you have that you got this land he says well Constantine gave it to me this adds legitimacy okay so you see here that uh, there is Constantine giving this to the Pope and giving getting a blessing and all of that kind of stuff um, well there is uh, Lorenzo Valla who was a Catholic priest and a humanist and he exposes this as a forgery and this is something we would call textual criticism and really some historical analysis as well that, uh, you know, that, that he's, you know, as a historian, he's looking back, he's like, look, there's some anachronisms here. Uh, then there's another part where, you know, this isn't really, uh, you know, accurate at all, uh, you know, or he looks at the text and he says this isn't the type of phrase he would have used or that sort of thing. It's a really long, uh, you know, piece of writing that he's putting out there. Um, but, you know, this is basically exposing this medieval text as a hoax. Uh, and it's something that the Pope certainly wasn't, uh, you know, all going to be all that crazy about. Uh, so that's that's really as far as the contribution of Vala. As far as Pico and Petrarch, I have already uh, you know kind of been over um, those already. So just uh, just keep that uh, keep that in mind. Um, let's see. All right. Let's check out the next uh, the next question we got here. And we're kind of trying to wrap things up. Keep in mind that Miss Noah and I both offer uh, you know tutoring. So if you want extra attention and that sort of thing, uh, you know you can uh, you know welcome to go to my website and contract us uh, contract with us for tutoring. Uh, you know because we're uh, you know trying to trying to get a little business here as well. That's why we give some of this stuff away. All right, so the Italian city-states, why were they not able to unite? Well, Machiavelli would tell you, James, that because they didn't have the right uh, sort of leader, um, that you didn't have this strong man who could unite uh, the Italian city-states. Um, so that's what they would have, uh, you know, what they would have said to that, uh, is that there just wasn't that kind of strong leadership. All right, let's see what else we've got here. Um, let's see. Hundred Years War, the Great Schism. Some of that stuff that's going to happen. Let's see. Coffee Addict. Um, let's see. That. Uh, let's see. It looks like Miss Noah has kind of uh, answered that. Keep in mind that's technically kind of outside of the scope of the course as uh, as well. Now, the Great Schism. Uh, Miss Noah is talking about that. This is something you know where you have one pope in Rome and a pope in Avignon, France. Uh, this is something. This Great Schism uh, that. Uh, you know, you see people lose confidence in the Catholic Church because the Pope, uh, you know, you got these two people claiming to be Pope and people are like, well, which one is it? And the French are supporting this one Pope, the Italians are supporting the other. So it's really, keep in mind that the Reformation, part of it is that society is becoming less dependent on the Church, but also that you're dealing with a weakening of the Catholic Church from within. Um, let's see. I did go over Daniela, the causes of the Renaissance. Uh, you know, that's that's the case as well. Also, Miss Noah wants to note that the Hundred Years' War read, led to the rise of France. Uh, that France was really not that powerful of a country. Uh, it was very fragmented. The nobles had a lot more sway than the king, and so the Hundred Years' War is really kind of a birth of uh, French nationalism. All right. Uh, let's see. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay, so uh, Ellie's noting every time I lose, I mention a YouTube video, I lose about six viewers. Uh, you should be going to look at these after the hangout. But then again, if you want to look at these during the hangout, go right ahead. Just remember to watch the ads. Um, so that's uh, that's that. All right. Brief summary of the Habsburg Beloy Wars. Okay. Um, 
Airily, let's go ahead and ask Miss Noah about that one. That's going to be something that's really more in uh, in her purview. Um, you know, you'll see basically, uh, you know, Fran you know, you got France and the Holy Roman Empire uh, that are fighting, and really, you're kind of seeing some foreshadowing of the. Thirty Years' War later on, where of course the Bourbons will be in France, but uh, you know you've got this kind of rivalry between the Holy Roman Empire and the French monarchy. I wish that Miss uh, Miss Noah were here to uh, tackle some of those more complex questions. Maybe we'll have her here some other time. These things are uh, really complicated to set up, and I think uh, is that a cautious Is he yeah. back? Miss but, Noah, okay. um, she's answering questions in YouTube. She that um, our webcam or something uh, wasn't working right, so I okay. um, tried to figure it out for like an hour, but she just started at, uh, answering YouTube questions. She's on the chat. Okay, awesome. Well, uh, you know, looks like the chat is going, and Miss Noah is answering uh, some questions there. Um, yeah. I'm kind of hungry, so I'm probably going to wrap up uh, in just a second. Uh, let's see if y'all, you know, if you're here in the uh, in the chat, you might want to uh, maybe come up with a hashtag. Um, you know, if uh, you know, if we think about a hashtag, so that you can continue this conversation on Twitter and maybe uh, you know have a few more uh, questions answered and that sort of thing. Um, so let's see here. All right. So good, good. We've got a really good conversation going on there. So you might want to think about that just a way to kind of keep this going and uh, you know keep in mind like I said Miss Noah and I offer uh, AP tutoring services. I'm going to go ahead and uh, you know just self promote a little bit uh, you know since uh, you know y'all been here uh, you know hopefully if you like this service uh, you know we've got various things we offer. Keep in mind there's a lot of stuff available on my website for free that you've got PowerPoints, you've got a playlist, a Renaissance playlist, uh, you've got a, a review guide which uh, this has 10 things that you need to know for the exam plus important people and then if you go down through my documents you can look at those but I've also got a uh, review guide that you can fill out uh, in conjunction with my live hangout that I did back in May and I've got that live hangout on the playlist even though it's very long uh, you know it's something that if you want to fill this out uh, that would be something worth uh, noting and then if you are interested in AP tutoring services uh, we do all kinds of things we'll uh, you know we offer a got some still working on the images here but we offer a study buddy session either 15 or 30 minutes uh, if you would like me to join uh, in on your group study session or talk to you individually on Google Drive we can do that uh, also we grade DBQs and FRQs uh, so still working on some things with that we've got different levels of service on the DBQ packages um, FRQs 15 bucks per that includes analysis it's not like we just grade it but we've also got some instructional videos and that sort of thing so if you are interested in AP tutoring just go ahead and contact us uh, I'll be online every few weeks doing a hangout uh, but you are welcome to contact me or uh, Meredith if you are interested in some uh, some further AP Euro tutoring and of course I'm gonna keep uh, putting videos out and all of that kind of stuff so, you know, the website's up, videos will come out, and I'm going to do all I can uh, to help you uh, prepare for the AP Euro exam. So thank you all a lot for joining us tonight. Uh, hopefully you learned something, and good luck on all your tests. And keep in mind that uh, just keep looking on Twitter and Instagram, at Tom Ritchie, on both of those, and you can see when other live hangouts are going on. If you want to be added to my email list, tr at tomritchie.net. Uh, so just send me an email or contact me through the website. Uh, add, add you to the email list. I'll be glad to do that so you'll get notifications of these hangouts and they're happening in the future. I'm hoping to do them about every two weeks. Uh, so you know, just, you know, come prepared with questions and all that. And these hangouts will always be uh, be free of charge. Just uh, trying to do what we can to help you with the exam. So I'll be back soon. Until next time. I'll be back too. I'll be back. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Akash, sure you will. <laughs> All right. Later, Mr. Richie. Have a good night, I guess. See you.